need to unmute yourself, Lid. Lid is Lid. All oh, right. Sorry, I was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> So where, where are you based, Lydia? Uh, I'm in Penpont in the Fris and Galloway at the moment. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Galloway, like Galway, actually. It's the closest. Uh, apparently, the occasional letter goes astray from here to Galloway. Does it? <laughs> yeah. So just welcome, if you've joined us on uh, Facebook, Feskama, Dogs of Conversable Gama, welcome. Uh, we have everybody that we need so uh, it makes sense to just kind of kick off um for those of you that don't know me i'm marcus marcantonez i am the uh, poets republic's gallic editor um i'll do some introductions uh, on screen at the moment you should be able to see neil young who's our managing editor up in stonehaven publishing editor you oh, sound I'm like a, send me sound like an official <laughs> you're a kind of nazi neil aren't you <laughs> I have my moments. <laughs> and interjecting there, we have our submissions editor, Hugh McMillan, down in Hello. Galloway. <clears throat> so we're here to celebrate the, the launch of our ninth issue. It's hard to believe that we have survived <laughs> into nine issues, particularly in what is a, well, a perilous uh, publishing environment for poetry still in these islands. But here we are, we're hanging on in. Uh, one of the few publications um, to for ground poetry in English, Scots, and the Celtic languages as well, uh, with a particular emphasis on Scottish Gaelic. Although with this issue, we're pleased to build some bridges with Ireland as well, um, celebrating this year of Columba. And you'll have noticed from the front cover, he says, picking it up, um, this is the first time that um, we've kind of featured the the Gaelic speaking world on our cover. This is Madivon and Ordan, who I'm sure will be known to a lot of you, the Sky Bard, um, and uh, the, the issue celebrates her bicentenary, uh, 200 years of Madivon and Ordan. So she will be featuring a little bit in, the, in your poetic and musical offerings today. So um, I think that's enough for me. I'll hand over to Neil to say a few words. Well, you, you've kind of you kind of done the job there. That I was going to do. I was just going to introduce the magazine. Really pleased that uh, we're we've managed to be technically proficient so far. Uh, a few minutes into our first ever Zoom forward slash Facebook event, our motto is in print, online, off stage, and on uh, on off message. Uh, so this is the online bit, and. Um, I like the uh, the fact of I was very Zoom skeptical, you know, when lockdown started, you know, but and and I've come up with a new word that I, th I think people are going to be baby Zoomers. So um, I'm Zoom skeptical, but I've done a few now, and I think it's it's really it's, it's, it's there are really great benefits of it. It's very democratic. You can get lots of people from different parts of the world all into one room. Another great benefit is the audience can leave at any time, walk out, and the participants, the readers, performers, don't know. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it can be a bit discombobulating, but there are also great things about it. Now, Marcus did give me a running order. Yep. But I I'll put it in the chat. He's going to put it in the chat. Uh, so, um, <laughs> we're starting off with Bob. We're starting with Bob, who is based in Teesside, and I'm really pleased that Bob's taking part. Um, the first time I met Bob was in, two, was it 2018 or 2019 at the Scottish Poetry Library when he came to read. Um, Bob came to read as part of uh, the Poets Republic Unleashed, mm -hmm. and he was brilliant. He was like this dynamo on stage i was gobsmacked um it was it was visceral and physical performance and uh, i went away kind of weeping into my pint thinking what am i gonna do now you know how do you follow that so really pleased he's here he's always you know a, a, a poet really to follow and really to watch 
Okay. Thank so, you. Shall I crack on? Yes, crack please. On. Okay, well, I am absolutely delighted to have a poem in issue nine of the Post Republic and honoured to be able to share some poems at this event. I think the Post Republic is one of the most important magazines being published at the moment, especially given the current political situation that we're in. So, um, as I say, I'm, on, I'm honoured to have a poem in there. The poem that's in there is uh, called Vagabonds, and it's one of the poems that I've been writing over the last year. I've become quite interested in the Spanish Civil War and the international brigades. Uh, and I've written maybe 24, 25 poems, maybe a small pamphlets worth, um, and Vagabond is part of that. So I thought I'd give the others a, a little bit of an airing. I've not uh, read these out before to an audience. So the first one is a prose poem. It's called The Chamber of Limbo, which is a phrase by Laurie Lee. It goes like this. You are there to be called upon to kill whenever the order comes from up the chain of command from someone with a clear review of what in hell's going on. But that time for killing will land, and when it does, it's bound to be quick and frantic. In the meantime, you should wait out this interminable buffering, feed kindling to smouldering anticipation and wonder what else you're made for but to feel the temporary lag in the stream of moments, slow minutes, sluggard hours, frozen silences between manoeuvres and action, like sculptures waiting for the breath of life or uneasy lambs bleating for the butcher's knife, unsure of whatever design is in preparation for you to partake in, unaware with all your spirit of idealism, with your sticks, your stones, your sling of the military Goliath amassing the heavy weaponry you volunteered to face, while you sleep on tiled floors of once grand landowners' homes, hollow as a snippet of on hold Muzak in an endless loop of repetition, a half sung song uncertain but ever expectant of when the next bomb should fall and someone such as you shall answer the call. Um, and the next one is called A Particular Shade of Red and uh, it's from a testimony by Fred Copeman in a book called reason in revolt. It starts off with a little epigram, which is a fragment of a poem by David Marshall, who was one of the international brigaders from Teesside. Uh, the little snippet of the poem goes, our children are not taught their history and you forget them at your peril. For though you fight as well as they, you'll be betrayed as we were. And my Peace goes. Not the red of the setting sun licking the tip of the hilltop over the Ebro, nor the dribble of red vino down the side of a glass raised in a toast to liberty in a cafe in Albacete. It wasn't the red cross of St. George who on this occasion had shrunk away from the dragon, not the glowing pool of illuminated pavement in the Parisian red light district where he'd had a medical examination and been interviewed to check his political orientation. Nor was it the shade of the Red Express that shunted him and his comrades south through France, nor the red field of the communist flag or the emblem of the three-pointed star. It was not the flash of a salt-splashed moletta passing over the horns of a wounded bull. It wasn't the glorious crimson of wild roses at the edge of Thornaby Wood. Nor was it the paper poppies in lapels on Armistice Day, or the real ones growing between crosses in Flanders fields. No, this particular red followed a quiet pop as a small hole appeared in George Bright's forehead in the moment before his body dropped. No siestas on Suicide Hill, surrounded, outgunned, with no better than glorious fools in command, and the king of mosquitoes taking the bliss out of each and every conviction. John Unthank from Eston cracks a well-known joke about the Generalissimo, 
es una pina cu si un hija da puta. Then gifts his voice to a pigeon, that it might fan its tail, clap its mossy wings, and cooing take flight to escape the garden of blossoming wounds. One particular incident I'm quite interested in that I've been uh, reading about, it, it happened on March the 31st, 1938, in a place called Calacetti. And June, it was the June the Battle of Belshite, and uh, the British battalion were being escorted to their forward positions and came across a group of six tanks, which they mistook as Republican tanks. And Bob Cooney says, with terrifying suddenness, the tanks opened fire on us. Another group of tanks emerged from the woods on the right and simultaneously hordes of Italian infantry appeared, yelling their heads off. It was their absolute shambles. And then he goes on to say how um, Wally Tapsell, the commissar, was shot immediately by a fascist officer in the first tank. So this poem is for Walter Tapsell. It's called Where There's Wally. There is Wally toppling like Toro in the horror de la verdad. There's the glare in his eyes even before he hits the ground. There is the small cloud of gun smoke from the barrel of the pistol. There is the rosette bullet hole flowering in the soil of his flesh. There's the stricken, unbelieving stare of his comrades in ideals. There is the turret of the tank from which the shot was fired. There is the flush of panic in the faces of the ambush brigadiers. There is the panic, headless chicken run as realization sets in. There are the boys ducking and diving as if caught, oggy raiding. There is the sporadic yell and splutter of hastily returned fire. There are the Italian infantrymen emerging from the tree line. There are the British throwing tins of food as if there were grenades. There is Lewis Clive backing orders like a starting gun. Regroup, retreat. There is the scatter and scramble for escape into the woodlands. There is Bob Cooney shouting, I thought there were ours. There is Malcolm Dunbar dragging Bob behind a tree trunk. There is Bob insisting they can't leave the, their commissar like that. There is Malcolm pointing at Wally Tapsell lying still on the dirt. There is his voice saying he's gone. Now run, run, or we're done. And the last one is uh, the one that's in the magazine called Vagabonds, and it starts with a little epigram from A Moment of War by Laurie Lee. It starts, we were an uneven lot, large and small, mostly young, hollow-cheeked, ragged, pale, the sons of depressed and uneasy Europe. Inconvenient on your home turf, with your unsavory beliefs, but far from unloved, Invisible only to those with titles and a seat at the table. Unexpected, you came to lend a hand, smuggled over borders that turned a blind eye, drawn to so much rawness in vineyards and olive groves, torn from the soft hands of gentlemen. You composed anthems for your blacklisted histories. I recognize those tunes. Snows melt on the Sierra, battle lines scribbled on archaic maps, the evenings full of flambéed voices on radio broadcasts from underground bunkers. You lived afterwards and always as Christ in the wine press under a corpse soil shawl of suspicion. So that's me. Thank you very much for listening to me. Let's all unmute and give Bob a round of applause. Hey. Thanks, Bob. That was spectacular. We've got some comments coming in on Facebook. Anna O'Manor says, oh, it's all cool, Neil. Uh, Jessamine O'Connor says, break a leg, Bob. Well, you broke your leg. And uh, Mandy McDonald says, Bob, wonderful Civil War poems. So Thank you very much. Keep sending us your uh, comments. Great um, stuff. Your, your They're not, uh, are they all the same person? 
<laughs> no, different yeah, people. Yeah. Well, at, least two, at least two of them are the same person. <laughs> they are. They're all Jessamine. <laughs> got a stack of aliases. <laughs> so I'll hand over to Shug, um, who's going to introduce our next reader. Right. Show. Thank you very much. Well, I'm Hugh McMillan. I'm the submissions editor of uh, Poets Republic and, and help put together with Maggie Gibson, help put together this marvellous uh, edition we've got here with some wonderful uh, poets. I'm going to introduce Sharon Black to you. Uh, I, I came across Sharon Black, first of all, when she when I published her on the, the Plague of Poems website, and she put a wonderful poem in that. Uh, she's from Seven in France, and she runs their uh, writing sort of uh, facilitates writing weekends and uh, runs a press called Pin Drop Press. I should read out to you, since I know there's a lot of poets listening, uh, I should read out to you part of our biography from, from our website here, which uh, I'll just run through it. And... I've won a few prizes in my poetry, including first prizes in the Guernsey International Poetry Competition of 2019, Poets Meet Politics Poetry Competition 2019, the London Magazine Poetry Prizes 2019 and 2018, Cheltenham Poetry Festival Competition 2017, Manchester Cathedral Poetry Competition, and it goes on and on and on. And I know that our poets listening and that hair at the back of their necks is rising as they listen to this. Uh, you know, it is absolutely thrilling, but somehow also unnatural. But we know for a fact that uh, she wins these competitions because her poems are, are, are wonderful. Uh, next year, she's got to do two poetry uh, collections coming out. The first from Vagabond Voices in the spring, and the next one by our own Drunk Muse Press, uh, Red House, will be coming out towards the end of next year. So that's wonderful achievement. Her poems on the page have a, a beautiful deafness of touch and she reads them beautifully too. So here's Sharon Black. Thank you so much, Hugh. And um, hello everybody. Can you hear me by the way? Because I never had a chance to check yep, my audio. Yep. Today. Okay. Um, so I'm delighted as well to have a poem in the current edition of the Poets Republic. I don't actually have my magazine here with me, but because um, it hasn't arrived yet. But I have seen the, um, Neil sent me a copy of the back page, so I can see what it looks like on the page and it looks lovely. Thank you so much for type setting it so beautifully. Um, I'm going to read, um, so the poem that appears in the Poets Republic um, is from a sequence of poems that is going to be coming out in pamphlet form quite soon. And that is the front cover of the pamphlet called Rib. It's being brought out by, thank you, <laughs> it's being brought out by Wayleaf Press that Mike Barlow runs. And I wrote the pamphlet um, after I broke three ribs last year um, following radiation therapy because that apparently uh, weakens the bones and I hadn't been told that and so I was just kind of going about my normal business and ended up with three broken ribs and then they began to heal and then lo and behold they broke again. So I had quite a lot of last year spent looking after my broken ribs which gave me also quite a lot of time to write about them. <laughs> so I'm going to read, um, and so the one, the, the poem that appears on the back of the magazine is from that pamphlet and I'm going to try and keep within the limit of time here by pressing a wee thing on my phone. And I'm going to start just by, uh, yeah, starting at the beginning of the pamphlet and read a few from that sequence. Scan. Three broken ribs, the doctor says. On the screen, a trinity of dark bands where light should be. It's where you had the radiation. I leave, less heavy, clutching proof of why I must abandon washing, cleaning, egg collection. Abandon hiking, laughing, sex. That angry way I jab my laptop keys. Um, so the pamphlet is a kind of mix of personal poems about what I experienced. And also I got kind of carried away on the subject of ribs and ended up Googling to find out everything I could on the subject. <laughs> and um, this, one, this one actually isn't one of these, but the the other kind of thread that runs through is um, it kind of just using a more kind of imagistic approach um, to my own situation, make sort of metaphor, that metaphor, making, making metaphors of it. And this is one of these, thoracic. The cage was built of reinforced steel. Rescued animals were locked in for their safety. Strays came and went. Food was passed between the bars. 
medicines provided and blankets, soothing words. All day, all night, the echo of the keeper's heartbeat was a comfort. Some liked it so much they stayed. Now the cage is porcelain, the bars cracking one by one, the inmates pacing, highly strung, the blankets lie in shreds. Food is thrown, shit smeared across the floor. The lions eat the monkeys, the fox is eyeing up the rabbits. There are feathers everywhere. This poem is the one that appears in the Poets Republic and it is called Underworld and it has a footnote um, which I'll read out first. The Paris catacombs hold the remains of bodies exhumed from Paris's overflowing cemeteries between 1786 and 1788 to shore up the city's ancient limestone quarries. A small part of the tunnel network has been open to the public since 1874. Underworld. Here, you just see skulls and femurs. Big bones are best for building walls. They line two miles of corridors in six foot stacks, in waves, in pillars, an ornamental cross, a lopsided heart, empty sockets staring, toothless grins rueful as the, as the living amble past. Smaller bones are piled behind and out of sight. Six million skeletons to fill the city's bowels and save the streets from sinking. The air is cool and musty, like an old stone church whose worshippers have all moved on. But peer along an unlit path, you'll catch a, jut a jutting fragment of rib or clavicle, a crumbled spine, a phalanx, blunt little knives trying to dig their way out. And I wrote that after I visited the catacombs. Um, a couple of years ago, it was an absolutely incredible experience, one I've been looking forward to for a few years and I finally got the chance. Uh, this next one here is called Medical. A common side effect up to 15 years after treatment. Ribs that fracture as a case is lifted from a train. A stack of logs is carted to the house. A grandchild swept up for a cuddle. My doctor advises rest, it's no big deal. A common side effect of being a doctor every day. Wreck. 200 fathoms down, only ribs remain. Salt water breathing through cavities where skipper, bosun, mates and deckhands slept and sailed, exhaling fishing days. Strong winds, rising waves and troughs. The slamming of the hull as a swell spilled over. Battening hatches, bailing water. I'm just trying to decide which ones to read here. Okay, and back to sort of ribs that most people probably think about when they hear the word. This is rack. In the butchers, fleshed and blooded, they're an anticlimax. Rungs on a ladder going nowhere, a noteless stave. Scraped and cleaned, they're razor shells, thrown up at low tide, light as balsa, as if one lonely night the sea had ripped ribs from its breast to conjure some companions. This one is called Tattoo. Take this inking needle, make a mark on your own rib. Eye your subject as a Japanese master might a grain of rice. Set tip to skin and steer it round a corner, any corner. Make the inside visible, reveal yourself to your own eyes. Plant a seed along each curve, then write your story, the root from which you grew, the tongue which led you to this breath. Don't worry what you might let slip. It's not about perfection. The needle drips as your hand hesitates. 
Say it softly. Rib, rib, rib. I was made from a pure arrow of thought, a chevron softened to a crotch with one purpose, lightning. Poor Adam, clutching his chest as if wounded, believing all he was told, I was already off, hungry. The whole fruit, yes, seeds and all, until root and branch were growing inside me, aimed at the sky. He was merely the thunder. Um, so when I broke my ribs for the second time, um, I was trying to be careful because I knew at this point that, you know, my, my ribs were obviously quite fragile after um, the therapy treatment I'd had. And um, I was carrying a box, a, a stack of boxes of um, pizza boxes to the recycling containers in the village one night and it was quite dark and there was an upturned object in front of me that I never saw and I got, went whoosh, right over the top of it got back to the house thought oh no that's okay I don't feel anything too bad but the next day I realized that you know they broken again <laughs> so um this one's about that experience and again it's dark as I empty sorry it's dark as I carry empty pizza boxes ribs cement basins puff balls to the bins. An upturned cement basin, pizza box, puff ball, rib, sends me flying. Another break, the doctor says, you'll have to be more careful. Walking in a field, a friend clips a puff ball, cement basin, rib, pizza box with her foot. Powder flashes round her, then disperses like a bellows coughing talc. The doctor says some ribs, puff balls, pizza boxes, cement basins never heal. It only hurts when the, e the broken edges rub. In bed, I'm careful, but wince each time I turn. I'm careful, but my chest feels like a fist has punched a hole in it. I'm careful, but can't stop thinking of exploding cement basins, puff balls, pizza boxes, ribs. That's me. Thank you for listening. Let's give Sharon a round of applause. Great. <laughs> and that tinkling bell sounded the timing, the perfect timing of a 10 minute set. Wow. <laughs> Impressive stuff, eh? Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Sharon. We've got some comments here. Loch Carra writing saying, can't wait to get my copy of this issue. Um, Sadie Masker is saying, thrilling, but somehow unnatural is a great quote for a blurb. Andy Murray, <laughs> not that Andy Murray, is saying, fantastic poem. Uh, Mandy McDonald saying, fantastic opening line there. And another um, affirmation there from Mary White, who's also a friend to the magazine. So you've definitely got some fans, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Right, I'm going to hand over to Neil again, who is going to give us a poem, I hope, and then introduce our next reader. Obviously, one of the key things that makes Poetry Public special is that it is edited by poets, for poets and lovers of poetry. So take it away, Neil. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Uh, uh, this is a poem from my forthcoming uh pamphlet, slim volume, booklet, I don't know what they're called these days, chat books, there's all sorts of names, which is called After the Riot, the, po uh, the, the collection, and it's coming out in August by Nine Pens Press, which is a new publisher, which I'm really pleased about. And this is called, um, it's quite timely given uh, that it was the, I read various newspaper articles this weekend that was talking about the centenary of the creation of Northern Ireland. They seem to overlook by the, the fact that by the centenary of the creation of Northern Ireland, you've, you've got the centenary of the, the free state, or what, as it was then, which then became the Irish Republic. And as somebody who uh, was hatch matched and dispatched from uh, Belfast, um, I'm not really sure, really brutally, honestly, whether the centenary is something worth celebrating especially given uh, current circumstances. And anyway, this is a, a poem called Imperia, which is really about 
the unraveling of Britain, the United Kingdom and the detritus of its empire. One day when you least expect it, when you have almost forgotten how your cartographers executed lines on the map, this ghost will appear in irreconcilable form, a beautiful, grotesque creation of your past. Those measurements scored by your predecessors, those lines will hair trigger right back. A union flag in the oily Atlantic where its inhabitants salute your remotest godhead in their sleep. A desert storm, a suicide pact, the very notion of yourself polluted by myth-made longevity. It could have been any of these, or tanks and flags burnt black that led to your unraveling. But fittingly, it is this, the nondescript, a demarcation thread that runs through village lanes to sever kith and glens from sea to sea, a line that can't be folded back into schoolbook history. This is your neighbor's payback, neither bomb nor armed revolt, but line of turf you can't horse trade, treaty you can't unpack. Did you suppose this was just your heritage spoil or you could ride hysteria's waves and jolly on home? Did you imagine hubris as bad PR, your conquests as old cast offs left on track? This was your first, will be your last, a sliced up crop of land that soils your addiction to yourself. You poked this ghost, Britannia, be thankful it is more sparing than your least act. Thank you. Um, right, I'm going to move quickly on and introduce Kevin Higgins. <laughs> um, I'm really delighted that Kevin's here. Um, you have to be living on planet Zarg not to have noticed Kevin in recent years. He's, he's everywhere and uh, probably one of the most busiest, if not the most busiest, um, poet in any island off the Western turf uh, shelf of, of Europe. Um, he's also inarguably uh, Ireland's um, most preeminent sat satirist poet. Um, so it's great to have him here um, and doing the necessary work of uh, being a provocateur and um, throwing grenades into the uh, redoubts of cultural sterility and political uh, conformism. Kevin. Thank you so much, Neil. And uh, this is, a, I'm so delighted to have discovered Poets Republic. It is the dream magazine. Uh, and it's great to see the community around it and the uh, political edge as well. I'm actually gonna change the order very slightly based on what previous people uh, read. Um, this is a kind of a squib of a poem really that I wrote uh, a few weeks ago, and it's called A Royal Correspondent. There were a lot of royal correspondents on the television. And worst of all, when me and Susan sat down to watch something on BBC Four, I think it was, a, it was Music 1977, Susan was very unhappy that Prince Philip was also on there, even though it was, it was the following day. So this is a royal correspondent. Old as slavery, deep as Oprah Winfrey, enough neck to build another Princess Michael of Kent, hardworking as a slug with an MBE, making its delighted way through rain to punch holes in someone's prized cabbages and put pictures of same on the front page so the nation can spend its time debating cabbages. Um, that's that. And this is, uh, this poem has been approved by my wife. 
and obviously it's a completely imagined scenario or those that aren't imagined is from a very, very long time ago. And this is the poem that is, uh, appears in the, in the current issue and it's called People I Almost Slept With. The memory of our lovemaking is the Olympic medal, the leading middle distance runner of my Irish childhood doesn't have in his cabinet to remind him winter nights of his moment of triumph because he kept finishing fourth. Our unzipping each other's trousers with our teeth was the opportunity we were both forever failing to leap on. We came close as the Dutch national soccer team of the 70s did to winning successive World Cups. The nanosecond we first put our eyes on each other, the world settled back on its hideous orange sofa and waited for the inevitable to, in the end, not actually happen. In the finish, we were Robert Rensenbrink's flick coming magically back off the post, the last minute of injury time, and him learning the true meaning of never getting his hands on that most lusted after piece of 18 car karat gold, or to abuse a different euphemism. Our time in bed together was like the French restaurant we fully intended to visit, but we seemed to deliberately close whenever we were both in town. We'll forever wonder what it would have been like, the table under our eager elbows the chairs embracing our twitching behinds, the leather feel of the menus as our fingers moved nervously across the list between L'Escargot and Cocteauvin. We'll never know exactly what either would have tasted like. And the third poem I'll read is a poem I had in the previous issue of uh, um, Poet Republic. Um, and it's called, When a Serial Killer Dies. When a serial killer dies, Beelzebub's eyes leak tar tears at this latest one's paucity of ambition. The way he settled for the petty pennies of taking a ragged chainsaw to the moist necks of particular children in a disused wine cellar, when if only he'd had the farsightedness to leave the local playgrounds to themselves, he could have been Secretary of State for Defense, bought for himself with money that otherwise would have been wasted on old people, the ability to set fire to the Suez Canal or Antarctica, had named after him a bomb smart enough to go to Oxford instead of the imminent 25 past midnight film for television, perhaps been the diplomat who dismembered like earthworms, Africa and Arabia into manageable symmetrical segments and had a small country and scholarship in his old college set up in his honor, matured into the general who bravely pacified Indochina and Mesopotamia like a schoolboy methodically tearing the legs of a spider in the quiet of his bedroom, the 12th so far today and had so many medals pinned on his chest, in the end, he almost fell over. Or been the peace envoy who oversaw the evacuation of the last German speakers from Danzig, watched them stream that stream and country roads like ants. After that, made a living telling university students how he did it. And here is a new poem that I've never read before, it has never been published, and it's called Guilt. And it's around the idea that they used to say, God is always watching you. And now, of course, Google and Facebook are, are, are really always watching you. And they are undisputedly real, whatever about God. Guilt. Now, God no longer watches your every thought. The priest withers in his confessional box for lack of anyone to tell him the sauce. Your mother's gone up like one of her own cigarettes. You rely on others to play the judgment game. What you've done, what you've failed to do. 
inspectors waft down trains from the way they click your ticket you know they know all the times you traveled without one the insurance assessor knows the not exactly whole truth you told on claymore your pal the part-time exam invigilator jots down details all the ways you cheated despite this the man at passport control lets you through this time the customs offer a officer imagines the sort of stuff you carried around the place in your innocent looking suitcase and finds you guilty with his eyes your smartphone is building a file of all your thoughts the last five years so it can take them out later and laugh at them with its friends the cctv camera remembers the times you weren't where you pretended you ask google some harmless question and it remembers all your other searches. And finally, this, myself and Susan were running uh, a series of workshops with a um, group and uh, she came up with the idea of writing a curse poem, kind of a modern uh, ver contemporary version of a gypsy curse, that sort of thing. So I thought, I wonder if I could do that. So I wrote this. Now, it is not aimed at any particular person, honestly. My wish is for you. That your son at Trinity College may graduate to become a rogue gynecologist. That his brother, the pediatrician, be suspended without pay. That your husband be caught selling wheelchairs that don't work live on national radio. And the day you discover all of the above, May the traffic wardens, every one of them, be East Galway Gestapo. May you lose your winning ticket and the gun not go off when it's supposed to. May your reflux be acid and your bowel be cranky. May your water forever be cloudy and the pharmacy be shut. May the funeral parlor refuse you and the lies you told haunt you long after the cat has made a litter tray of your ashes. Thank you very much. Hey. Mahu Kevin, Mahu Kadira. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've got some lovely comments uh, coming through. Lensley, Leslie Benzie saying, wonderful poems, very powerful. Kevin, you're hilarious. Um, and Mandy McDonald saying, Neil, if only hubris were bad PR, great phrase. Oh, thank you. You've Thanks. got some fans, Neil. So I must admit, I have made a bit of a mess of the running order. Hamid Dully, Katie, Ach, Sound Le Clark, Vermi Good Father is Katie Campbell. I have a mess, Barst Nikalik, as the night of show, I guess Sound Le Kinch, give a Katie Edevi, Gamama Taika, Vishinidish, Gurikisha, and Ha Katie Jirach Edevi Asas as a schema, Gashki Nabarsok, Ek Violin Barstok Nahalaba, Fadavali Edevi Tosh Ada, Egis Clew, Da Varsok Nikalik, Egis Nabars to Viska Skirg, She Shene did a Hinja Kujak, a Hoshane Bauno, Homan Railway, and a Dono in a Hyun Kukliana. I guess Machine Ha Mindaches, Kayu could be a Tosh Beckham Barsha Sacket, I guess the notion a gal or an Maribon and or an going Rutaviska Mama Sohidiche. So I'll just give you a wee translation of that. I'm thrilled to welcome my good friend Katie Campbell, um, a poet and a singer, a winner of the Uncommon Gale Lock Gold Medal um, in Danoon a few years ago. Katie has uh, been involved with Shug in the um, Poetry Champions uh, scheme at the Scottish Poetry Library and she's really been doing a lot of incredible work to bring notice and uh, due attention to Gaelic poetry in this country. Um, talented poet in her own right and uh, she's uh, been supporting the, the Poetry Bullet for a number of years um, and we're glad to see her in, in issue nine. So, Shinu, Katie, Dalosht. Tatlat Varkish. Yeah, Hami was a tall TV and show. I was Shin a mo hit a leg to Varshjoch Riev. Oh, Hami Fatan's course, Legida Hushain, a Himi Mayiko. Just saying that this is my first ever actual poetry reading. 
I'm much more comfortable singing on stage, although I talk in front of uh, teenagers every day, uh, speaking in front of adults is terrifying. Um, so, Hamidal Hoshule and Dan Aha Alson Arvin Naija, Poets Republic, I guess, um, Nimi and Sagalic, I guess, Jason Alan Birla. So, I'm going to do the poem that I I have published in uh, issue nine. Um, I will do it in Gaelic and then I'll do it in English uh, for those of you who aren't blessed uh, with the other language. Uh, so uh, this is called uh, Gida Banushka, uh, Legacy of Water. And I found that during lockdown that I overthought everything more than usual. So this is my uh, <laughs> overthinking poem. Tul Atuchim. Gamvahig les Munchen, Shedig Nescuti, he grunhig tonchur. Nashachshiantan, irichiaklig, strunam achoris, sris me haston and the viachan vaminchen. Dorshig, nechidis, minum vrashig liani, gamis and duhwati, kuhunig and ga. Skaslia hulig, fruahig and torig. A flood falling, drowning me with thought and searching the abundance of dark clouds wading through the flotsam. Seven elements diminishing my stream of words struggling, but I still am spake from the ideas in my mind, the deluge pouring, and I at the peak of flood tide aiming for the high watermark at the conclusion of the cascade, fording the torrent and shaping the result. Anish Hami Adol Jianu Aim. Oren, excuse me, leave me my piece far talk. I guess rhyme me and verse or son a an negashki Gaelic troska ha markish na farst. I guess she mullet ben rona in tenemahid. So this is a, a poem I initially wrote as a, a rowing song um, about an ancestor of mine who. A um, little light in her window every uh, night for over 20 years um, after she lost um, most of her family from drowning accidents on the small isle of Rona just above Razi. Hanikam ba said and Kruai, Tubishna Mara eva ho Kruai, Vahig Marahin Sihuain had beeld of Bentur Shahronai. Get Nahi ach Bantrach Voch, Gahaich the Lassi saw this cord. Ginyimpi, Ginyera, le Erin de Golda, Moluch, Ben Vuaga, Ronai. Fat chorus fichet blian satri, Yarshig, Solisheve, Guni. Kumuch ne shalvaturin van stri, Tain, a ven huiksha, Ronai. Ur kyamert and navy, Dichid Vik, Vokapchen a comet, is her stirish, Famishin eriket a hood ye, Koe, Ben Huichen de Ronai. Etter and Tice and Arkisich Vor, Hal the first three high solace and rosh, Gubrag be kinyaking, er shonich, Mother ben Uasel, Ronai. Um, and this, I mean, though, Lech, eh, Dan, eh, that on an Arif, eh, Coik, eh, Ju Poplach and Bard, eh, I guess, eh, Gil and Tenema here in Dan Shaw, eh, this is a uh, poem published in uh, issue five, and it's simply called Love. Alson Dorak at this Hanneke, Guslethach, Krupach, Fabach, and the Akajach, a good Aharach, a Germanum, Kuchlik, most spirit that their troig is troig, Gam Hilyerich, Gam Yarstich, Gam Vyarstich, not was. And that one was about my husband, and recently I, this next one has never been uh, performed in any way, and this is Gil 2, and this is about my daughter. Hanike Guhopen, Irwa Fuer Yauri, Nam Laya Sanchomer Yalut, Lan Fuer Ganekel, Da Hul Hrein Sedjer Akrach Knesnekel. And the all the sashin should in one's hill ele, call the gibra. I'll read this one in English as well. 
it came unexpected on a cold winter's day, lying in that white room full of expectation, without fear. Two round eyes, bright, hungry, inquiring with the knowledge of her ancestors from another world, together, forever. Mesh Amidal Jenny Fed of Alan Aravikehu. She Oren Iraq and a tenum Eden Oren Show. I guess a screamy show or so on the few head a Hyangs and Adam. I guess a Vayan and Iraq again on show. This one's for my sister and um, it's but the contrast and um, probably parallels between our relationship and um, also the Iraq war where she was serving at the time. Kurson na chelu aun an drast, fau aun nam fash trim huv, fau brakal is dan el spirit bail, bukher if is meed of yuhur. Joch slanchig an aram ar saichir in gashgil, a yen ar yach ar yish de chostri. Togavo anish, kawaka da fis, san tadman an alts de nasach. Kurson na chelu aun agil, ko ilis an til bukhuvlin. For Farkish is Faramich Nirvash in Og, Kahainim and Drast and Dever. Doch Slanchig and Aram are sighted in Gaskell, a Vuanik and Blar and I in knowledge, Togavoanish, Co ache of a fis, Uriat Falchvor, Sundui. Kurson the Kiluan the Gry, and Kainat and Tryan Rarzai, Sir Lion who hewn a cloich severe, a hollow and town, but Hyovrat. Doch slanchig an arm ar saichir in gashgil, an duich hadam gun inyl mili, she shawanish, ko eke of a fis, a merch avans ar nunsi. Kurson na keluan rim huv, vau ans a huv le aivnis, hod mohorin an keit dun reishimich, or rainu an tug na dinid. Doch slanchig an arm ar saichir in gashgil, lian ir lian gun vuai, gun vuanach. She shall anish, co eke of a fis, a vel over some bee, so far shall. Kurson a keruan and drast, mahu hast from the green. She hurach mulag velu hast swan, skun chili hooking, it are cheerse. Joch slan chigan aram, are sighted in gaskel, a yen are yach gun taich se costri. She shall anish, co eke of a fis. And Kirkwood, the Vias, their smanchin. Um, Hami Adol a Kriyanaku, Kriyanaku, Le Oran, a well, Atta and a Arif in the age of public of art, a Le Marivodan and Oran, it a Hit Dilak, a Hami Adol a Shang, a Hang Oran, a Nurvami Og, a Oran, a enemy to a Agasha. So I'm going to sing a song by Mary Vorten and Oran, um, the great Sky Bard. Um, her face is on the front cover, so kind of got to do it. This is Nurvami Og, When I Was Young. Mogs me kirir fikanish, lenyer matin hechen smi aun nos. Vas pre gem nichen kiau ne hene, se grian ne kirir jachen stor. Vagah paesh ke kishles nam biantan, kur tuar ne haiche ne yaun fuskat. Is as mo hyun haina nuje kram vor, vorsh na mo haine nur Horsh na mochain ye make nye rain me nach fine him baum go kyan hal moskyod. A follow se yaur go loy his bainchen, gun solis lainchet, a kyan na notch. Big oi grey crown for the kyan is dancer. 
Sachabeden Tagen schön sich glauben vor Frauen. Zwan totige andere schwan je ja und Was na bukeine nur famiak. Nur hör mi kurz der gach glauben es kruachen vor den Rami swaif ja say if that is your first reading as a poet uh you knocked that one out of the park that was great that's my wow. uh, we've got some lovely comments coming in um there um katie beautiful reading says leslie bensley mary therese taylor saying why did i guess brown um hadley saying they're not quite at the level where i can understand the gaelic but the shapes of the sounds are beautiful can't wait to be able to read the original. Um, Christine Tate saying lovely singing. Um, and a couple of people asking about the English versions. Um, Katie, of course, is preparing a bilingual poetry collection as we speak. So keep a, keep an eye out for that because um, it's on the way. All right, Mata. So I think I'll uh, hand over to Shug, who's going to introduce the next poet. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to introduce Lydia McMillan, who is a student at Edinburgh University and at 19, I think, is the youngest poet ever to feature in the Poets Republic. Certainly, she's the youngest poet to appear in the Wigton Book Festival digital platforms, where she was a featured poet in the, the recent Big Bang Festival. Uh, you, can, you can still see her, her, her sort of a video there. Uh, several of her poems refers, in fact, to stars and cosmography and so on. I hope she might be able to read some of these this afternoon. It's fantastic thinking of somebody who's good at 19 and doesn't have to go through 30 years of faffing about being crap like the, the, the rest of us. But their age is, a, is an irrelevance, really. Uh, because it's not hard to find people of 19 writing poetry, but it is hard, I think, to find them writing poetry with this degree of delicacy, of touch and maturity. So anyway, uh, I'll hand over to, to Lydia, who's at the start, like, like Katie, at the start of a, a promising uh, career as a, a young writing woman. Thank you very much. Um, so the first few poems I'm going to read are part of a sequence of poems um, on the theme of space and the universe and the sort of way that art and science sort of interact with each other. Um, and the first poem I'm going to read is the poem featured in this issue of the Poets Republic, which is titled For Laika, First Dog in Space, and is inspired by the story of the first animal to be sent into orbit around the Earth, whose story I find very sort of tragic and moving. Um, so this is For Laika, First Dog in Space. All their phrases, cosmic rays, irradiance, mean nothing to you, an orphan plucked from the streets of Moscow, all you can be certain of are the walls pressing down upon you, the heat, the breaths shorter and wearier with the turning of the hours, and the solitude, though you're used to solitude, family long faded into the dark matter that muddies the reaches of your memory. In fact, you have always found that silence invites thoughts of better things. Warm fur, children's laughter, a place by the living room window. You stretch, beat your tail softly on the floor, turn your face to the sun. Um, and the next poem I'm going to read is called Friedrich's Dream. Um, and it's inspired by the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, who had a theory that time is circular and history will repeat itself sort of infinitely in an identical manner. 
which I found to be quite a sort of romantic idea. Um, so Friedrich Stream. The vibrant cities fall to sand and children collect them in buckets. Somewhere else, the monks of Iona are crushed by Vikings again. Some Greeks name the Pleiades the Pleiades. Dante bites off the end of his quill and the slavers turn in a spray of sun-sodden foam and return empty to their harbours. I lift up my window and watch as Andromeda shakes off her chains and lurches out into space, body trembling beneath a mass of uncharted stars. Um, and this final space poem is called The Great Comet of 1680 over Rotter Rotterdam. Above me, a stray flame grazes the sun. By my feet, a young boy weaves through a crowd, hair haloed in flagging light. These faces are wide and pale and they gaze defiantly like moons. Around them, the stars spin on in their strange voyage, a festival of ghosts. The city spills formless shadows over the harbour. Beyond these squat rooftops, a future awaits us. Um, and the last two poems I'm going to read, I wrote while I was staying in Edinburgh, uh, where I used to often go on sort of long walks or in the city. So these two poems are sort of based on things that I saw during these walks. I'm trying to write something, but there is light in the trees in the car park. Behind them is a garden. A woman emerges shouting from a rippling curtain of bed sheets, and three children drop their toys on the lawn and follow her out of favour. In their absence, the little red house is dirty plastic. The dolls and soft animals shed their names and lie misty eyed among the ferns. A man on the radio says schools will open again tomorrow. I imagine Eden withered, it was empty for so long. And my final poem is called Notable Burials. I wrote this at Grange Cemetery in Edinburgh. The gravestone of William Hunter has been tipped sideways by bloated tree roots. His name is reduced by weather to faint finger painting and obscured by a clump of ivy stirring in the wind. A grimy blue sign points me towards this cemetery's famous residence. Once executives of gunpowder works and biscuit companies, football club founders, philanthropists and net factory owners. Now destinations plotted on a map like buried gold, surveyed by fawning Madonnas wreathed in vines and circled by spaniels and tourists and lurid windbreakers. No escape even in death from these emblems of modernity. Like everything else, notability bears a cost. From the bridge above, the tombstones are barely distinguishable, like rows of misshapen chessmen. I turn to leave, lost in this tide of sun-dazzled stone, and I pass Zach, one and a half, missed always. That's me, thank you very much. Hey! Well done, Lydia, that was beautiful. The apple does great stuff. From the tree. Fantastic. <laughs> Can we get your work in print anywhere, Lydia? Apart from the Poetry Republic? Not currently. This is the first time my poetry ever appeared in print, but hopefully sometime <laughs> soon. Ah, uh, well, you started in the best place possible. <laughs> uh, wish you further success with your publications. Um, I forgot to ask Hugh to read a poem. Um, that was, he was supposed to precede you, but actually I think it's more appropriate that you go first and then Hugh follows. So okay. I'll hand over again to Hugh. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you can actually catch up with with a, a po a, that video poem of Lydia's in, on the Wigton Poetry Festival book site, book uh, book festival site. If you if you're looking for more stuff from her, there'll be a tide of it, I'm sure, later. I'll read a poem called "Couple New Cumnock. It's uh, um, on the, on the train from Dumfries to Glasgow passes through this um, town called New Cumnock, which might be familiar to, to Ayrshire folk. Couple new Cumnock. He's drinking strawberry hooch and adding to it from a green vial like in a horror film. He is half sleeping on her handbag. They both look about 15, but my compass is off in these matters. The train is passing new Cumnock and he takes his parka off to cover her, even though she's already wearing a parka and strokes her face under a curl of blonde hair that seems carelessly arranged 
but has taken a hundred thousand years of human evolution to place in exactly that heartbreaking manner on her white cheek. I want to say cherish and take care, but somehow it's like a painting. And I wouldn't say cherish and take care to a painting, even though it has flaws. So I watch them instead, poised like this, while the rain comes down. Thank you. Thank you. So God stuff. We've got some um, we've got some comments coming in for Lydia as well. Leslie Benz is saying, love that second and last poem in particular among your many stars, Lydia. So there you go. You've got a uh, you've got a fan already. Uh, right. Claire Bleasdale saying, I imagine Eden Withered and uh, Mandy McDonald saying, Lydia Andromeda shakes off her chains. Fabulous. So there you go. That's some killer feedback from, from, from some killer poets there. All right, Mata, I'm about to put my trilingual hat on. So time has that fall to a good dry kid, ille eden och ille sam of yari as dunnal. I guess to sam kokomportach eden lahanach, I guess a tache eden starche ta bainch ike le dramiach guilge le rainch kiene, maskrive nyod, I guess my hag nyod, if we lie, tache ek geno PhD, ek gen tu siach na guilge, ek a last jet na hals quale galia. So um, I'm really thrilled to welcome the second of our Irish poets, um, an Irish language poet, definitely. And uh, this is Sam Ophiari from Donegal. Um, Sam is comfortable on the page as he is on stage, as I said there in Irish. He's also got a background in Irish language drama, both as a writer and a performer. And he's currently doing um, a um, PhD in Irish language dramaturgy at uh, University College Galway. So I'll hand over to Sam. Modern thing of Irish, good. I my good. Um, I wish my Gaelic were as good as your Irish, or half ah. as good. Um, I can just about follow if I squint, and that's about it. Um, hello, everyone. Jamie Teshiv. I'm Sam. I'm from Donegal, in the northwest of Ireland, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here in the company of such amazing poets. I hope you won't mind the sudden dip in quality you're about to experience. Mm. Um, I love the Poets Republic for a few different reasons, but one of them is that it reflects this vision. I think a lot of us share uh, for these islands of a place where the centre isn't where it has been for so long in London or Dublin, but a place where the diversity linguistic and otherwise um, of these islands is celebrated and shared like this. Um, and so it's in that spirit I'm going to read uh, two wee poems that um, have been included in this issue. Um, the both, both the poems are in Irish, so what I'll do is I'll read each poem followed by my attempt to translate it into English. I'm really excited to get to do it this way because when I write poetry, one of the things that's most important to me is the sound, the actual shape of the, the poem on your ear. I try to write for um, to be read out loud and to be enjoyed and spoken. And so this way, people who don't have Irish uh, or much Irish can at least hear what the poem should be and hopefully in translation get what I'm trying to say. And the other reason I'm happy is that a lot of people ask me why I write in Irish and not in English. I came late to Irish. It's not my first language, even though it's my native language. But I think when you hear my attempts to put English on these poems, it'll become very clear why I don't write in that language usually. My first poem is called Anyamnacha, uh, which means names. Um, one of the aspects of Gaelic or Gaelic culture um, that people might not be as uh, might not be very aware of is the intense and deep relationship between place and language. Everywhere the Gales have gone in these three islands, we have named every rock, every tree, every hedge. I live near, near a town called the Crooked Hedge. Um, everything of note in the landscape. And with each of these names is a story. We call it Jin Shanachas in Irish, the lore of place names. Um, and so to know the names and to know the language is to connect not only with the landscape, but with the people who live there and how they saw the world around them. But of course, as these languages have been beaten and burnt back to the edges, to the sea and to the high places, the names might remain in some form or another, but often the stories are lost. So, Anyam Nacha. Is there no way on the arm? Nach ro Anyam Nacha er na hardi, na na pwakana, na kladi, karagacha, na sruhain. Rihu pwesti, haro ach pwesti on, a mach ik anyam nu la fan, ik luch ar da smali yurunecha wahi shid and chain, no lema waki yurun ach bahulia da rasni shid gaji, gro anyam nacha flursha er fud an elain. Gurhi fokla go hedrum er eden nachira. In you bein 
na crane e glubu fina nanyam nacha. Lian lepage go trum er na fara in fokla er na crick go glua le janach blinta. E jach fadjeke kuhn. Lanyart. Kavis. Nach jockey sheru gliche. A skibus nosen janiyad. Er huel. Names. And of course there was a time when there were no names on the hills, the fields, the rocks, the streams or shores. Children, there were only children then, would run about naming wildly the little hill of the thrush for the place they heard the bird sing or lame man's leap for the narrow ford they crossed till names lay plentiful all over the island words sitting lightly on the face of the land. Today, trees sag under their epithets, names crowd the fields, words smother the hills as thick as years old dust in a long abandoned house. Who knows, but may come a wind some day and blow them all like the dust away. The second poem I'm going to read for you is, is called Kurumi Kitch which I've translated as cares of a cat. But kurumi is a little bit heavier than cares. Your kurumi are your, your duties, the jobs you have to do, your obligations, your responsibilities. I don't know whether it's the same in Gaelic. Um, there's a lot of, I get a thumb, see a thumbs up from Marcus, and it shows how poor my Gaelic is. I promise I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> hey, Gaelic is really good. Stop apologizing. Um, Montang. Um, I've never understood why religions that go in for reincarnation always put humans, being human is like the top or near the top of possible experiences. It seems very clear to me that all the best lives being lived on this planet at the moment are being lived by cats. Fat cats who get fed every day, who get to stretch and be naturally athletic and look like badasses, even if they're not that bright, uh, get scratched behind the ears whenever they need it and spend their days searching for sunbeams to lie in. That to me seems like the goal. Don't know about you. So this is Kurumi Kitch, the cares of a cat. Fi iri grainya fi she filcha er hain er wallach riksha, la kabi kain chas of yons a yahar of yashu shin class, out of you a olum. Is tuil do an geogrash, a gursi slanchahus, haisha ur in a niahain, moister in liahain, gajila sharu, ligisha screech, a tumul ella er hyoch than lahir, the dagen and fun er ihe. Even Baha and Scodure, I dare should. I guess even Baha Polichore. At the Mawogum, Ach Kura me catch or war rickshaw. He didn't get even his galore. Cares of a cat. By sunrise, he is folded in on himself atop a rickshaw to taste whatever heat the leather holds, a trick worth knowing. He is zealous in his hygiene, spending an hour in his cleaning little master of licks, till with a shaking stretch he rests a while longer on the heat of the leather until it's time to eat. Lovely the life of a scholar, they tell me, and lovelier a politician's. But had I just the cares of a cat on a rickshaw, you'd not catch me complaining. That's it for me. Got to meet the mic of modern time. Hey! Got to meet the mic of some fish on just. Right. Uh, um, oh, I'll just read the, just let me bring up the live feed so I can read the, read the wee comments there. I can't believe we're reaching the, reaching the end. Oh, Linda Jackson saying your intro almost felt as Poetic as the works. There you go. Well, you are a consummate performer, my friend. Daryl Bryan saying, agree, drew the lives of cats. Uh, Mandy Beatty saying, your beautiful explanations of the poems are like poems themselves. Yeah, well, there you go, you see. <laughs> Super stuff. And thank you to everybody that's um, that's been watching online with us. Um, do remember that um, 
we're going to archive this performance and uh, put it up on my YouTube channel. So um, if you've got friends and family that aren't on the old Facebook, um, the link will be available to send on. Um, and I'm sure that you'll be seeing the clips again. So I think it's my turn, isn't it? All right, Mata. Um, what shall I do? Oh, I'll do both. Um, I'm going to read a wee short poem that is uh, going to feature in my forthcoming third collection. I've sent off the, I've okayed the manuscript and I've sent off the blurbs for print on demand. So I think it's imminent with uh, Evertype. Um, that's the publisher. It's called Dulach. And I'm absolutely thrilled as well that my friend there, Sam Ofiari, has contributed some um, Irish language uh, translations of the Scottish Gaelic works, which makes it all the more special. So thank you very much, Sam, for banging the Irish into shape. So this is called Agus Misha. Um, it took second place in the Wigtown Gaelic Poetry Competition, not last year, but the year before last, when it was Kevin McNeil judging it. Um, and it's kind of like my response to the Me Too uh, phenomenon that happened, something that was far from comfortable, far from joyful, but really, really necessary, not least for putting women's experience out there and also for causing the men on the other side of the equation to do some necessary introspection um, and of course I felt some solidarity there because this kind of thing is not unheard of in the gay community as well so I guess Misha and you scrivi sin da achgol na kori kanshig a kwerach gain tlu farsta ha shin cha ha gach kiarni na doinye sin doisha stu mi smiusa kawa na nyalas kruai karanje and by the night, the sea is disk, no sofa is fun alive. He just hints in a dash, go boha, dark a dish, tell a dancer, lawn gunya, not the yak and love a vendia. Savage and can kun, nehenai. Sunday show, smiu, still misha, kinyak it an inchishen, ud heat of opage, fai fehiv room to kitchen. A vish gej, mad a hook and joch ketka a vien a holomag. A hyan gun bleem is daha gun scope gun tahatas vine chin, se prav ach gian na huine. Ach, nur a yedich me savatin gus a horak and erach gain and brain of rickish, vice gun drag a wadach in machrachin, in the high me creatures gebrach, the hueless trumpelium gafa fiata. U me, me u, Agus Misha. Me too. Today we compose two words, no mark of agreement, of agreement but condolence. Solidarity stretched out across each quadrant of the world. Likewise, you, me, I, you, together in our cruel experience, shared. The woman seated at a desk or on the sofa, phone in hand, her mind retraces a darkened alley, a dance hall and a horde that did not quit the hand that touched her. A quiet quarter of silence in her mind. Likewise, I, you, you, me. Mindful of that night, just in from work, he waiting in the kitchen, pissed, as if the drink were licensed to realise his desires. Head stupefied, safe perhaps in sozzled slumbers, his memory might erase the act. But as I arose in the morning to feel his fingers still upon me, deep below the waistband, I knew then he left a mark upon my skin I can never remove. It will always travel with me, unseen. You, me, I, you, me too. So she back on bar stock how tapale son uh bull the bush. I'm gonna finish with a wee song from Madivo and the Nordan. Um and if you will uh, oh I'll also draw your attention to the editorials in the in the magazine that um the th three of us have contributed, Neil, um Shug and myself. Um putting Madivod kind of in hoping to put her in contemporary context as opposed to 
engaging in you know literary criticism or, or historical kind of uh, analysis there Shogun in particular talking about um the theme of uh, land ownership which was one of her uh, key concerns me talking about gallic equality particularly in the um, literary milieu so do pick them up and let us know what you think you know we're a forum for debate and we welcome you know your comments and, and thoughts as well um so the name of my editorial was um was well in, next to my Gallic editorial. We've published this song of my divorce, um, Hamiski Jalupna Burela. I am sick of English speakers, or rather, English speaking monoglots and the privilege they exert over Gildam. Hamiski Jalupna Burela, Hamiski you can't dead eat of sound them hang at fat and keely. Hamiski Jalupna Burela. Home like Misha Hanam Brew at their side, you're in the Jean Mongoose Gaw. Captain Turner's Daphne, you saw, scalp me over, strain me eighty. Could at me a lachen for us, could at bars from Hyal my forsak, spay my cockish hair on ocean, who me soos me strain me major. Ha do I hear the troll ye glisha grash kachin mo fuan? Can ye create the bokka glushes? Nak chicha huarag sereper. Habe shut of me faking ye can do ye car a clack me. Ach be blan and catch the sevi come out like Hat ne shed him for dach, ek na nijen han and quantan. Can ye game ek marsted puller, scanyel poor halen and jail? Come be it shut na turn ye cord ye, sound the mesk ye chahoshes, far and pavish diving corny, sound hard arginic. Hami ski jo loch na burla, hami ski you cat that eat if sound lim hang at fat and keely, hami ski jo loch na burla. And after that, tap a little sunshine, thank you. Thank you. Well, Neil, I think that brings us to the end of our poetic yeah, celebration. Um, I'll leave the final words to you, my friend. Okay, thanks Thanks a lot, Marcus. Thanks for hosting everything and punching all the buttons so efficiently. Um, except a little blip in the middle, you know, where you cut out one of your, one, one, of, the, one of the poets, but we got round this anyway. Round. Um, <laughs> thanks for everybody here for joining us and sharing. Um, your, your poems and songs. That was really wonderful. And thanks to everybody who's joined us on Facebook and taken a few hours out this Sunday. It's really appreciated. And um, I'd just like to point out that, uh, yeah, we still got a whole bunch of um, magazines here, um, which includes a cracking demolition job by Marcus on the Scottish literary establishment for its neglect Neglect is the most nicest way of putting it of Gaelic and in Scotland. Um, temporary poetry. Um, it's just a really good read. And uh, still live in the disunited kingdom. That includes post and package. We are robbing ourselves. All you've got to do is PayPal us. Uh, at poetsrepublic at gmail.com, five pounds, and we'll get one in the post here. Um, if you're ordering from outside uh, Britain, unfortunately, it's a little bit more expensive, seven or eight quid. I'd love to do it a lot more cheaper, but, you know, it's, it's, it's blame Royal Mail, you know. And um, thanks a lot. Thanks to everybody. And keep tuned into our Facebook, Twitter, and website for news of when we're looking for issue 10, you know, 
because we think this magazine is a bit of a phenomenon in uh, Scottish literature. Um, there's a paucity, as she was telling me earlier, of uh, outlets and forums for really good contemporary poetry. So the more stars in the firmament, the better. And we're not going anywhere. Um, uh, we're still battling on and we'll keep on doing so. And up the Republic. Hey. Thank you. Up the Republic. <laughs> Thanks a million, everyone. That was really great. Great fun. Thank you. Thanks for being there, Kevin. And I can't wait to read your article because the magazine hasn't arrived here yet because we're in on another continent now as well as <laughs> in another country. Aren't we? So uh, it'll probably arrive tomorrow. Lines for that one. <laughs> it's, it's definitely on the way, Kevin. It, it's, it's being yeah. posted. No, I know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. I'm really looking forward to that, uh, to the whole magazine, but especially the art too. Uh, Thank you, Galic people. Submitters, yours uh, here. <laughs> Is it? Ah, yes. <laughs> Running on Highland time. <laughs> so it'll be uh, Wednesday or Thursday, maybe. Yeah. 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 Okay.